alarmed. We should never be thrown. Your faith, God will heal despite your fears. God will heal. family it's time to pray and on today i want to look at first timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1 for our devotional thought in prayer let me just encourage you this is a season where there's quite a bit going on with regard to our politics regard to our government what's going to happen next in our presidency and many elected offices uh, that go down the line even from there and i want to challenge you because disciples are called to get involved in the justice creating and justice maintaining mechanisms in our world. One such vehicle is voting and advocating for our civil rights as well as our general rights. And more, more than just the presidential office, more than just those that are in high areas, this includes every single thing, each area that affects civil activity, our responsibility is to get in and understand and vote for those areas that will make a difference in our communities. We, we end up reaping much of what we don't like because we've sown in ignorance. So it behooves us not only to be aware, but it behooves us to vote and to do so in a way that, that will change and make a difference in the community that you live. So I wanna say on the front end that we really need to be encouraged and really need to be motivated and empowered to get out and do our part. The early voting is coming up. Um, you can vote by mail. All of those areas and opportunities are available for you. So make sure that you do your part to be the difference maker, to be salt and light in the community that you're in. And, and again, voting matters. Voting matters. But also prayer matters. Prayer is the opportunity for us not only to involve our mind, uh, in the things that go on in our world, but also to involve our creator in the process. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1, I want you to read this text. We're going to spend all our time here. In fact, through this week, I want to encourage us to see God's hand in the policy and in the practices of our world, our government, and the like. The text says, I urge then, first of all, the requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, verse two is what we're after, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. I wanna just pause right there in those verses and lay some things on your heart. Then we'll talk to God in prayer. Number one, God is encouraging every single disciple. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is teaching that you and I ought to pray. Part of Part of the power in being able to live in this world and function in this world not only comes through prayer, but in recognition of how important prayer is for everyone. And in this case, he lifts up the notion that you ought to pray for those that are in ruling places, the kings, in our case, the president, the vice president, all of those congressmen and senators and, and the like, all of those individuals that make up the high ruling areas in our world, but also pray for our local and community leaders, those that are in those places. Why? Why does God advocate that we pray? That's one of the questions you ought to ask. B because these individuals that are in these places are put in a position where they are immediately 
in hostile territory. Everyone around them in one way or another is bucking for something that they want. And part of the problem with being in a territory where individuals are politicking for what they want is that much of the politicking is counterintuitive to who our God is. So we ought to be praying because you don't want a powerful individual to become hostile to your God. If they become hostile to your God, then they not only uh, be, uh, uh, advocate things that are counterintuitive to who God is, but it affects God's people. They are targets. So we ought to pray that God insulates, pray that their well-being uh, is established. Why? Because as their well-being is established, our well-being will be established. The well-being of those that are in rule and those that are governing and those that are in positions to take care of communities affects the church. It affects the kingdom agenda. It affects the community. It affects you and it affects me. So pray. We ought to pray. But then number two, not only are we encouraged to pray, we need to remember something in this text and also in the grand scheme of who our God is. Our prayer is not necessarily about the man or the woman who's in a leading position. Remember this. You and I have to learn how to, as some of the young folks say, get out your feelings. It's not about how you feel about the person. It's about God's agenda. Remember, disciple, every person who's put in a position to lead, every person who's put in a position to govern, every position, every person who's put in the position of king or queen or, or, or some kind of policymaker, they are there by the hand of God. God, they are directly in God's hand. The man is in God's hand. Number two, the man is an instrument being used for a purpose that is beyond them. They have no idea all of what God is doing. But remember, every government, every rule, every nation, every king, it kingdom is in the hands of God. There's a proverb, Proverb 21 and verse number one, I believe it says that the, the, the king's the king is in God's hands and he he moves him however he wants to. To. Look at that one when you get a chance. But remember Daniel 2. Put these in your notes. Daniel 2, verse number 21. Romans 13, verses 1 through 5. Psalm 75, verses 5 through 7. They'll be on the screen. Notice something, that in every single one of those passages, the reminder that we have to hold on to is the promotion, Psalm 75, comes from the Lord. Romans 13, government is a tool used by God. They are servants in the hand of God. Daniel chapter 2, God sets up and puts down. He, he puts them in and takes them out according to his will. So when you and I pray, get out your feelings about how you feel about that person and make sure you go to God and ask God, God, I pray that your will be done through them. I pray that you use them as an instrument in your hand. Whatever you want your nation, your world, your city, your community to get out of this leader's uh, uh, government, help us to learn the lesson and learn it real good so we can move forward to have what you want us to have. That's, that's number two. But then let me give you this again. Number one, we ought to pray. Number two, we need to remember that our prayer is not about the man. Get out your feelings about how you think about these individuals. I don't know how you feel about the upcoming uh, potential president or the, the standing president. I know how I feel. I know some of y'all probably feel like I feel, but I got to get out of my feelings. You got to get out of your feelings and go to God and remember that the work that's being done through government is still an activity in God's hands. Romans 13, Daniel chapter 2. But then let me give you number three. Number three. God is telling you, you ought to pray for something though. What should you pray for? Look at the B clause of 1 Timothy 2 and verse number 2. He gives you th four things that you ought to pray for. And we want to put these in front of us. Number one, pray for peace. What do we mean pray for peace? Pray for the absence of external disturbance. Here's where peace is used differently. Normally when we talk about peace for the child of God, we're talking about that inner tranquility that we have. But here, when you talk about those governing individuals, you're asking for, Lord, let there be no external disturbance for the well-being of your people. We want peace. We're praying for peace civilly. We're praying for peace nationally. We're praying for peace uh, uh, on, a, on a governmental scale. We want peace. Peace. We desire peace. So pray for peace. Number two, pray for quiet. Different from peace. 
Quiet means that the individuals in our world, the individuals in our nation, the individuals in your community, the individuals in your city are allowed to live and carry out their purpose, their calling, their occupation without disturbance. We want peace. We want quiet. We want to be able to exercise our religious freedom and our regular well-being without disturbance. But then number three, pray that they are godly. Pray that the men and women who are leading and who are elected are individuals who are called back to a holy sense of living. Not an obscure, not a general, not a, a, a vague statement of some entity high in the sky, not someone uh, we're praying to the great power. No, 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 no. We want to pray that those elected officials can call on the name of Jesus as Lord and sovereign, bow the knee to God the Father, be indwelt by the Spirit of God. In other words, we are praying for their salvation and that they walk out of a deep sense of discipleship. We're praying that they are godly men and women. And then number four, we're praying that they are dignified. Look at the text again. All four of those are, are out there for peace, for quiet, for godly and dignified. What do we mean by dignified? Let me tell you real quickly. Dignified means that these individuals walk in a sense of moral earnestness. In other words, that they carry themselves. They learn how to be diplomatic, that they represent both the nation and the city and the individuals and their communities and God in such a way that the dignity that they have expresses itself in their behavior with other the individuals. They can learn how to be bipartisan. They can learn how to get along with anyone. They can learn how to work in such a way where we're not ostracizing and, 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 and writing people off or moving one group against another group or we're not racist or we're not doing things that forgets about those that are poor and impoverished but we live in such a way where our dignity and our behavior shows itself to everyone that we are to care for. Pray for your rulers. Pray that, that we have peace. Pray that we have quiet. Pray that they are godly. Pray that they are dignified. Pray in such a way that God's glory and God's kingdom agenda will still continue to be perpetuated as you and I honor God by praying because we ought to. Praying because it's not about us but all about God and praying specifically for what God teaches us we ought to pray. Let's talk to God even right now. Father, we love you. We thank you. We bless you and we praise you and magnify you because you are an awesome God. We thank you so much for the avenue that you've given us to pray. Lord, in this season, we ask that you hear our prayers, lean near to your people, and we pray, Father, that you clothe both our hearts and our minds in your principles. We ask, even right now, Lord, as we think about the upcoming uh, uh, procedures that will take place by way of our voting and, and bringing in and, and ushering in the decision that you have made with who will govern us, we pray, Lord God, that your will be done, but we also pray, Father, we pray even right now that there is a deep sense of peace, that there is a deep sense of quiet, there's a deep sense of God godliness, a deep sense of dignity that will rest, rule, and abide in the hearts of those that have been elected. God, we pray for both the president, the vice president, and every single office all the way down to our local communities, for our mayors and policymakers, for those that are in administrative positions, those that make the differences in our bills, in our children's lives, in our uh, activities that are offered to the community. Every area where we need to vote, vote. God, I pray that you allow your people to be both conscientious and aware that they are attentive. Help us to be students of what we need for how our situations are where they are. And if we want to see them change, help us, Lord, not to sit up and have a pity party and moan and complain in our own areas, but to actually get out and do what we need to do to make a difference. We are aware, Father, that we've got the perfect storm in this pandemic, the perfect storm in all of the tension that's going on, but we believe in you. We trust in you. We honor you. We love you. We know that you are our God. Give us the means, Father, to rise above this occasion. Give us peace during this process. Give us the ability to be safe. We pray, Lord God, that you rise up and allow your hand to be recognized, seen, and, and, and respected in a way where your people are governed. We love you. We thank you. We honor you. We magnify you. We praise your name. And now, oh God, we ask that you go ahead of us through this week. We go, go ahead of us and prepare the way 
So that when it's time for us to step in and do what we need to do, we do it in a way that brings you glory. We do it in a way that trusts what you've taught us. We do it in a way where your will be done and we are all right with your will. We love you. We honor you. We praise you and we magnify you. In the name of Jesus, we together say and we together pray. Amen. Listen, do your part. Do your part and be a difference in the, in the, in the civil change and the civil justice that will take place in our world. I'm going to pray for you. I'm asking you, please pray for me and let's watch our God change everything around us. God bless you and God keep you. of Christ the world. Devil is over. The body of Christ will come in at you. And they mocked him, they scared him, the people kept crying, we gotta crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, he said, oh, They nailed him there in public, right between the two feet. He tasted human torture on the cruelest kind. Not my will, but thine. Some were laughing, some were crying, some were happy at his dying. I don't say, I can't say, I could this ever be. Poor Jesus, as he hung on a tree, he said. Savior, in the garden, he said, Not my will.